looking for plants that will last and last, well, you've come to the right place. We're talking a show full of gorgeous perennials right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out and looking for creative ways to expand your living space outdoors. Now, in today's show, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, that's perennials. We all love perennials because there's so many gorgeous blooms to choose from, and they come back year after year. So they're the perfect garden companion. Now, I know that shrubs are their own category, but they do fit into a show about perennials. And let's face it, there's some of them that are really good companions for perennials. And if you start thinking about how you're going to frame your perennial bed, well, hey, you, boxwood, holly, even privet make great ways to showcase your beauty. Now, to that point, right now, let me take you on a quick jaunt to England for a little primer on a common garden design term. There's nothing like a profusion of blooms like these to dazzle us. The rich tapestry all these colors and textures make is really magnificent. Can you imagine all of these flowers in your garden? Well, this is quite some flower garden. In fact, it's one of the oldest herbaceous borders in Britain, dating back to the 1840s. Our tour of these blooms starts with a chat with Lady Elizabeth Ashbrook, who's been the principal force behind this garden for most of her life. You see, she was the one who turned this from a private country house garden into a national showstopper. But before she could open the door, she had a lot of work ahead of her. Not to mention, she had to convince her husband to be a party to her plan. This all happened shortly after the Second World War. It was just starting then. People were just beginning to visit gardens, to pay good money to visit gardens. <laughs> to walk around. To have a walk around. I mean, good money was probably half a crown a head, but um, even that helped. And I said to my husband, couldn't we try and get the garden back to what it used to be and open it to the public? And he said, but who on earth is going to pay money to come and look at this garden? And I agreed with him because, you know, there was nothing to see. The gardening is, is a, a moving, living thing. It's a unique art, really, because if you come to think of it, it's the only art which is always Moving on. Yes, it's I dynamic. I mean, you, you, pa you paint a picture and it's completed. It it's is. Now, one of the classic elements in a herbaceous border, I think, Lady Ashbrook, is that they tend to be planted lower in the front and high to the back. Yeah. But, but some variation in that always seems to help. It's, t it's tedious if you keep to that. So and having some variation yes, along the yes, edge I really helps it, break it I up. Think it, I think it's much better to, to break it up like it. But I think equally it's essential to have a few tall, noticeable plants soaring up at the back. And in the back here we have the scotch thistle and these big tall rudbeckias yes. and of course the American Eupatorium, the Joe Pye weed. Oh, is that what you call it? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Eupatorium, there's a, there's a purple and a white. I'm always astonished when I come to these herbaceous borders in Britain to see so many American native plants in them. Yes, I'm very interested. I hadn't realized how many plants we owe to America. <laughs> well, they yeah. seem right at home here and very happy. <laughs> My goodness, aren't those herbaceous borders in England impressive? I come back and look at mine and go, well, you know, these haven't been planted since the 1840s like the ones we just saw at Arley, but they're coming along nicely given the fact that these perennial borders are really only a year old. I planted out most of this back in the spring and it's really filling in nicely. I think we're going to have quite an exceptional show of color this fall. 
with these salvias. We've got Mexican sage here. I have asters, and this butterfly bush will continue to bloom. Now let's back up just a moment and talk about what herbaceous border means. That really implies the type of plants in the big border or the big bed that you saw at our lake. That means that the plants, the herbaceous plants, die back after a frost. If you looked at that garden in the winter, it would be flat and there'd be nothing but a mulched bed there with just a few of those woody shrubs sticking up. Now, what I have here wouldn't be considered a true herbaceous border. It would be a mixed border because I have some roses integrated among the perennials and herbaceous plants. I have uh, this butterfly bush, which would be considered a shrub. Now, the idea of a border like this is to have a wide enough display area where you could do a wonderful combination of plants, both blooms and foliage. In the winter, because of these tutors and the roses and some of the shrubs, I'll still have some visual interest. So it works out in all four seasons. Now I have to say, one of the great selling points of a perennial is that it is a plant that comes back year after year. And I use them in every possible way out here at the Garden Home Retreat. So why don't we go around and take a look at some of my favorites. Now early on in the spring, I have loads of peonies of all kinds of colors. You just can't believe them, they're so glorious. And then there are delphiniums and foxgloves and spiderwort. And then take this beauty, for example. It's a leucanthemum called Broadway Lights. Now, if you like the old-fashioned Shasta Daisy or Oxide Daisy, where you're going to love Broadway Lights, a sunny face in the garden that comes back summer after summer and just keeps producing lovely blooms. The flower petals emerge as a buttery cream color and finally turn to pure white. Flowering begins in early summer and continues into the fall. Now another showstopper has been this Mexican sage called Santa Barbara. I've been a diehard Mexican sage fan for years, but this one is shorter, making it great for the front of the border and for planting in containers. I'll definitely be welcoming this beauty back next year. Now this time of year, well it can be pretty challenging, we can get temperatures up near 100, I look for plants that are great performers, and you may look at this plant and go, well, that doesn't look like a very great performer to me. Well, it is. Um, don't be deceived by these spires. I've left them here to demonstrate something. This is salvia, indigo spires, and it produces the most amazing long spires of flowers. Now, this time of year, I'm gonna come in after they've gone through one cycle of blooming and just cut them off so the top one third of what you see here, I'm just going to go along and just cut off like this. And what that will do is inspire the plant to put up more of these gorgeous blue spires. Now some of the other salvias I grow include Mexican sage with its velvet-like flowers, black and blue salvia, and bog sage. Now one of the things I want to say about salvias as a family is that they're great performers and they love the heat. They are not particularly cold tolerant, so some of them will come through for me in my Zone 7 garden and others won't. So I would consider salvia a tender perennial, one that may or may not come back. So bear that in mind when you plant them. But you know, I would plant them just as annuals because they are so dramatic. I know I say I have a lot of favorites, but this one really is one of my all-time favorites, and it's a North American native. It's Solidago, or Goldenrod, and this particular variety is one called Fireworks. Given that name, because of the horizontal branching, and it's, it's very exuberant, don't you think? All these little stars look like a burst of fireworks. Now, what's great about this plant is it blooms later in the season. As you can see, here we are in late summer, and it's just beginning to come into flower. So when you're thinking about doing a perennial layout, or a garden layout, make some room for some of these late bloomers. Plants like asters, toad lilies, as well as the beautiful Japanese anemone. Now, what happens here after this plant is hit by frost is we just come in and cut it down to the ground, just leaving a little bit of stubble. Then next spring, the clump reemerges, and by late summer and fall, here you have it again, fireworks. I've had the good fortune to visit lots of gardens around the world, and I have to say that what really grabs me in terms of a composition is one of mixed plants. Mixing categories of plants, for instance, perennials with annuals, perennials, annuals, and bulbs, perennials, annuals, bulbs, and shrubs, yes, and even small trees. 
Some of these old-fashioned roses make great companions for perennials, as well as this handsome royal purple smoke tree here to my right. And hydrangeas, some of the sun-tolerant hydrangeas like limelight can be, well, exquisite combinations with perennials. And when you're looking at perennials, there are several different ways you can look at them. Sun, shade, dry conditions, wet conditions, so forth. The other is bloom period. Some bloom at one time with a spectacular show of color. And then others will bloom throughout the entire season. And these are very intriguing to us for obvious reasons. Color through the entire spring and summer. And that's exactly what we have here with this little plant called hyssop or agastache. Now this one's called Color Spire Steel Blue. And it has been blooming in this garden since March. It is absolutely beautiful. And I love the range of color from the sort of softest violet to a very clear sort of blue with the tiny little flowerettes. Now, just over the zinnia here, you'll see another wonderful perennial, an American native plant, blanket flower or gallardia. Now, I love this cultivar because it blooms all the time. I mean, just like the hyssop or agastache, it has been flowering since March, and it just continues to throw off gorgeous blooms. And not only are the flowers beautiful, look at the little seed heads. They are adorable. Now, you really can't talk about perennials without focusing on foliage. Foliage and what it brings to the garden is such an important concept in garden design. Take, for instance, this plant. This is an artemisia called Poes Castle, named after a wonderful castle in Wales. The foliage on this is so beautiful in that it looks like filigree or lace. I love the gray color because gray is almost a colorless blender that will work with any color palette. I like to say that gray plays well with others, unlike some of the other members of the color family, like um, orange. Orange is very difficult. But anyway, back to gray. This plant likes full sun, and it needs good drainage. A lot of gray foliage plants really do need uh, well-drained soils. Another one to consider would be lamb's ear, like the big leaf one called Helen von Stein. Or if you want some other perennials that produce great foliage, check out hosta and heuchera, as well as variegated iris. Now let's get back to the artemisia for just a minute. There's another quality you need to know about. With this one in particular, it's deer resistant. So if you're having problems with deer nibbling on your garden, try this plant. It's a great one. Now, the thing you need to keep in mind is not all artemisias are created equally. This particular artemisia is not invasive, but artemisia oriental limelight, on the other hand, can be very invasive. You see, it has this variegated foliage, but underground it has stolons that will spread all over your garden. So if you do grow it, grow it in a container. Well, it feels like you're getting closer to completion when they start spraying paint or applying paint on the house. I'd like to think that we're almost done, but we're not. But it is exciting, nonetheless, to begin getting some of this porch and tablature painted and all the trim work around the windows. What we're using is a paint that is really based on some new technology. It has a lifetime warranty. It's 70% thicker than the paint you might ordinarily use. Now the color I'm using here is sort of an off-white. It's going to make the porches, the railing, and the columns really pop forward. All the woodwork, the columns, the window surrounds will be this color. Now we made sure that the wood that we're using up here for the cornice is one that is very long-lasting. And with this paint that has a lifetime warranty, you can see we're trying to put it up here for the long haul. It's a long way up, so we want to get it right the first time. You know, there's nothing quite like a hedge for creating a room. And just like the guys working on the house, creating the walls of the house, that's exactly what we've done here. I've created a little intimate room with this needlepoint holly hedge that surrounds this center point the greenhouse, which in a way is sort of a room in a room. <laughs> now, if you decide to construct one of these garden rooms, some of the things you need to keep in mind, just, well, approach it like a house or a room that you would build. In this case, you can see I've furnished my little greenhouse. And the floor, don't forget about the floor here. I have lawn coming up to a change in materials for the floor, and I have a pea gravel 
pad all the way around it, which makes it a very tidy and convenient workspace. But, you know, the thing about it is these canvases, I call them, are a great backdrop for a building like the greenhouse or flowers. Now just think back to the footage we've seen of Arley. The backdrop of the herbaceous borders, well, it's an evergreen hedge. I have to say, one of the things I enjoy the most about this part of the garden is being able to bring out some furniture and just sit back and watch all the flowers and vegetables grow. It's very relaxing. And more often than not, I don't put this furniture away. I guess that really plays into the whole garden home concept, doesn't it? Well, I do worry a bit about how well they'll withstand the weather. I try to buy furniture that really will last a long time. Recently, I was in a factory where they showed me a process by which they actually can weatherize some of the most delicate lawn furniture. Gosh, look at this, Gary. Yeah, this is uh, a little different, isn't it, Al? Ah, my heavens. <laughs> it's a vat. It is. This is where we put in the first line of defense on the finish for the uh, wicker. It's our dipping station. I guess it and is. And you can see there the frame is submerged fully, and then it's brought out here to do uh, to drain, and, and it gets into all the little areas, the, the nooks and crannies, so to speak, of the wicker. You'd be really hard-pressed any other way to get some sort of coating in all those little places, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I mean, you can see, just looking at that frame, all the different little areas that have to be covered. And look, it doesn't take any time at all. No, it, it doesn't, and then we'll drain all that back and reuse the material. So you're recycling here? Yes, we are. Very we good, are. very good. And this is just really the first step of the process. What we're doing, once we dip, the glazing process, but we also use a color coat and two clear coats to finish out the entire system to um, create the maximum life for the frame. I'd love to see some of the original, I guess the beginning of the process, what the, what the rattan looks like when it comes in. Okay, well let's take a walk. Okay. Well this is quite a sea of uh, wicker here. It is, Alan. Uh, this is the frames just as they come to us here at the factory. So this is what we saw that just before they went into the vat? Absolutely. All right. Now was it always imported, the, the, the finished pieces? Initially, it wasn't. It was a surprise to most people, but it was packing material within the crates, and the uh, factories up in the New York area would take it, take these small uh, strands of wicker and weave it into a piece of furniture, just like the one you see here. Really? Absolutely. So some, uh, er an early example of recycling. Sure was. Well, Gary, thank you so much for the tour. This thank has been you, Alan. very enjoyable. I enjoyed it as well. Hi, welcome to my design studio. This is where we take a look at photographs you send in of your properties. And today we have one from the big Lone Star State, Texas. Crystal sent it in. As you can see, it's new construction and it's a blank slate. So let's talk about what we can do around the periphery of the property first, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this green marker and I'm gonna start way over here and I think what might be nice, so you can create a sense of intimacy in this space, even though it's in the suburbs and in a, a neighborhood, what I would do over here is probably plant some type of evergreen. It could get quite large. Maybe a wonderful little gem magnolia. This magnolia doesn't get as large as the standard magnolia grandiflora, so it'll work perfectly, I think, along this side of the property. Okay, now let's take a look at this side of the property here. It looks like this is Crystal's property line right in here. What I would suggest is some sort of hedge planting that would come along this side all the way down. And one of the native trees of Texas that I love so much is the native Yopon holly. And what you can do is you can actually take these Yopon hollies and prune them up, leg them up, so you have the beautiful gnarly trunks and the canopy of the evergreen above, and in the winter, the berries turn red. Great source of food for the birds. So we've got our hedge over here. Along this side of the property, I would create a bed that wraps around, comes across the front, and then sweeps across this way from the corner of the house over to here. Now, let's talk about some of the plants we can use here. On this side, I would plant this entire side of the house, 
up to this point with gardenias. Down there in Texas, you can grow gardenias beautifully. And I love Old August Beauty. It's been around for a long time and incredibly fragrant. And then on this corner, I would plant a Japanese plum yew, one called Podocarpus makei. What I love is it's a fringy foliage. It's great for cutting and using indoors. Now, as you sweep around, we've got an opportunity here for a small tree. And here, I think we could plant, again, perhaps another native, the Texas redbud. And rather than doing the purple, what I would do is suggest that Crystal find a white one. They are really beautiful. And then under it, I would plant that with Indian hawthorn, Raphaelepsis. This is a wonderful evergreen shrub that has a pale pink bloom on it in the spring. So you can see what I'm doing here. I've got a white blooming red bud and then pink flowers under it with the hawthorn. And then as we come across the front or the foundation here, there's any number of ways you could go. Crystal, if you love roses, this would be an opportunity for some of the landscape roses, one called Knockout. And I would go for a medium to pale pink because we don't want to clash with the brick. All right, now as we come up to this corner, here's an opportunity for a Japanese maple. And I would plant a low screen of dwarf Burford holly just here. So I get the effect of a courtyard as you come around. And on the other side of this hedge of Burford holly, I would plant a tree. And here I would probably use one of the cultivars of red maple. They do very well in Texas. You could go with an October glory or a red sunset. The fall foliage would be dramatic. And then under it, I would just fill this in with a simple ground cover. Probably use something like winter creeper, which turns a beautiful bronze in the fall. Or you could go in there with Liriope, just mass plant it in monkey grass and you'll get a beautiful purple bloom in the summer. Well, those are just a few ideas, Crystal, and I hope they help. Good luck with your new project. Now, who isn't interested in saving money or saving any resource for that matter? Let me give you a little tip. I used to be in the nursery business and we had some very clever customers who would always come in at the end of summer when it was the bleakest, really hot, and they would want to buy what was on sale. Often we put on shrubs, perennials, you name it. Ready to get stocked up for next year, we want to sweep things out. So one thing to keep in mind, if you have a large area, go to your local garden centers in late summer and pick out what they have on sale. They often run sales at this time of year. Take, for instance, this row of Russian sage. That's what I did last year. I found all of these Russian sage on sale. Now, they didn't look like much. I had to use my imagination, but they were about to go dormant. I cut them back, kept them in an area until I was ready to plant them, and we made this vast row all along this side of the flower garden. And what's wonderful about them is that they bloom this time of year when it's so hot. And like many gray leaf foliage, they are completely deer resistant. You know, I've been gardening my entire life, and I have to say, I haven't lost any enthusiasm for perennials. Not only do I love the old standbys, but every year I want to experiment with new varieties. That's one of the great joys of gardening. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed being together as much as I have, and I hope you've picked up some ideas on how to integrate more perennials into your life. Until next time from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Well, we're headed back to the barn. Just take a look at this vista. These barns are a real focal point in the landscape out here. I'll also show you an interesting painting project I'm working on, as well as take a little time to look at the progress of the construction in the garden and around the home. Hey, we always have a good time out here at the Garden Home Retreat, and this show will be no exception.